Amen. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you again, Pastor McMurtry, for being uh, such a support and encouragement over the years, uh, even when that uh, unmentionable man was attacking me and coming at me under there. <laughs> so I'd, uh, you've always been a good encouragement and a real help for us up there, um, you know, just encouraging me to push through and to keep that, that group going there in Toronto, united and working and doing the labor and, and fellowshipping one with another. It's been a lot. Um, thanks again for the church, for the fellowship, and for the, uh, the help today and the support. Uh, I really enjoyed my time here. Thank you. Uh, I'm focusing in on, in 1 Corinthians 8, I don't know if I'll be back there, but I want to look at verse 9, that saying there, where it says, this liberty of yours, this liberty of yours. And so as you often do, you see a term like that, and you want to figure out what the Bible has to say. Here we are in Liberty Baptist Church. So let me go back with you to Leviticus. Are we Leviticus fans in here? Leviticus chapter 25. We get the first mention of that term, liberty. In Leviticus chapter 25, God is laying out what is known as the year of Jubilee. Let's begin reading there, Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 8. The Bible says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. In verse 10. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you and ye shall return every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family. Family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor. And according unto the number of years of the fruits, ye shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof. And according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits, fruits doth he sell unto thee. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. And what's happening here is God is laying out a reset button, okay? I think this would be a wonderful thing if we ever saw it play out in scriptures. I don't believe we did. It'd be a wonderful thing if we enacted it today. Basically, everyone had their lot, had their portion, had their inheritance. It was, it was family owned, right? But as things go, you know, you sell a little, you gain a little, you lose a little, ups and downs of the economy, you end up losing all you have, say. So at the 50th year was to be a reset where every man was to return onto his own possession. They were, they were given free course back to it. It kind of reset everybody. So you didn't have this thing that we have today where few people have all the wealth and the majority have next to nothing. They're just, they're just struggling and striving to get by. And so here we have a return to that original possession, which is in fact a freedom from bondage of, let's say, poverty or monopoly or oppression. And he uses that term very clearly in here. You shall not oppress your neighbor. You shall not oppress your brother, your kindred here at this time. And so that was the year of Jubilee. It was to be liberty or freedom from oppression. Jeremiah chapter 34, if you would, Jeremiah 34. Another mention of this term liberty used. In Jeremiah chapter 34 you have in verse 8 this. It says, Jeremiah 34 and verse 8, This is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. After that, the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. And so Zedekiah was about to be taken captive. He was told by God this would happen. Nebuchadnezzar was going to come in. They weren't going to stand a chance. And so they were going to be gone into captivity. Promises were made that Zedekiah would get through it. He'd be all right. But God was clearly indicating that they had something they had to do here. 
He said, by the word of the Lord, Jeremiah quoted from God specifically that this is what ought to be done. Proclaim liberty unto them. Verse 9 says that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being in Hebrew or in hebrew go free. That none shall serve himself of them to wit of a Jew his brother. Now, when all the princes and all the people which had entered into the covenant heard that everyone let his manservant and everyone his maidservant go free, that none of them should serve themselves of them anymore, then they obeyed and let them go. But afterward, isn't that interesting how they always did that? They did what God wanted here. They, they let them all go. They let their bond servants go free. They were no longer going to take bond slaves of the Hebrew people. God said, do it. They did. But afterward, they turned and caused the servants and the handmaidens whom they had let go free to return and brought them into subjection for the servants and for handmaidens. So here God says, hey, proclaim liberty unto all your brethren, set them free. For a time they did it, but then they said, ah, never mind, and reeled them back in. And when they did so, they very clearly broke what God wanted to do. And what he, they actually did to their brethren in this was they took them back under subjection. So liberty is the opposite of oppression. Liberty proclaimed throughout the nation is the opposite of being under subjection or in bond servitude. So freedom from oppression, freedom from subjection is what is in the, the heart of liberty. Okay. Now in the context of the Christian, what is our liberty? This liberty of yours, the title of the message, this liberty of yours is freedom from oppression and subjection to the law that has us condemned. Okay, the law brought us into condemnation. It only brought death unto us until we were set at liberty. And now we are free from the oppression. We are free from the subjection and being under the rule of the law. Romans chapter eight and verse five, verse one, Romans chapter eight. Let's go there. We'll learn a little bit more about this if we can. Lord, help me. Romans chapter eight. And in verse 1, the Bible reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we don't have condemnation. We're not under condemnation. There is no more of that if we're in Christ. If we walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. That's what it says in verse two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Glory to God. We are now free from the law of sin and death. You know what that was? Those cardinal ordinances written in the Old Testament. That thou shalt not, that thou shalt not, that thou shalt not. Condemnation. And we use it all the time, don't we? We take them to the law and we say, hey, look at these Ten Commandments. Tell me have kept them all, right? We tell them at the door. And there's no way anybody has kept them all. We can bring them back to Revelation say, have you told a lie? No. Well, you just did one when you said you kept all the law, okay? You're condemned by the law. But in Christ, he hath made us free. If any be in Christ, walking after the Spirit, key there, ye are made free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3 says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So there's something that the law came short of. What couldn't it do? It was weak through the flesh. Does it say it was weak through God? Now the law was perfect, just, right, pure. It was the epitome of perfection. God laid it out just so. But it was weak through the flesh, okay? If you were to read it in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7, your pastor's been through this recently. It says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. Okay? Did we just find that there's an error here in the law? No, this statement is made in verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith. 
I will make a new covenant. Finding fault with them. Who's them? The flesh. The flesh was the only problem with the law. Why? Because flesh can't keep the law. Flesh is doomed, condemned, destroyed by the law that reveals the fact that it is wicked, it is wrong, it is always an affront towards a holy God. And so God made a better covenant with better promises and instituted that with one condition. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you enter in to that new covenant. So how is this all possible? We'll look back in verse 3 and the second half. Just like I said, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinless flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So God became flesh. He became sin for us who knew no sin so that the law that was always condemning everybody in this room was now condemned by him. Amen. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. How? How in the world can we fulfill that righteousness? Because God sent his son to condemn the law, and it is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's a walk here that's associated with being free and being fulfilled in that righteousness, okay? Okay. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, right? If your mind is carnal, there's more death coming towards you, even the believers, right? If you're carnally minded, there is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, right? God promised life, but he promised life more abundantly. How do you get the more abundant life? Yeah, you believe in Jesus Christ and you have eternal life, you're blood bought, you're going to heaven when you die. But the abundant life comes from having the mind that is not carnal, having the mind that is spiritual, having the mind that is focused on the things of God and following after him by faith, letting the spirit be your guide and minding the things of the spirit. The verse seven says the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And we established that that flesh is just rotten. That's it. That's there, it, it is enmity against God. And so if we're yielding to it, of course, we find ourselves enmity against God. We find ourselves pushing back on the things that the spirit may well want to do in our lives. Verse eight. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're trying to please God by working in the flesh, like we talked about this morning, you'll be proven a hypocrite and you'll fall short, okay? You need to, by faith, have this Christian walk. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. In the flesh, it is impossible the same way to please him. So Christians too, and this is kind of an all-encompassing teaching that Paul's giving here about the flesh versus the spirit. Christians need to know better and need to understand that when we're walking and living and doing and, and being, we need to be mindful of the spirit and be spiritually minded. Otherwise, we're going to fall into the trap of our own flesh again. We're going to fall into that same condemnation. So why are we at liberty and what makes us liberty at liberty? Because God sent his own only begotten son and he did what he did okay but what is actually the mechanism by where a, a christian that is still in the flesh that is still has sinful flesh upon their born again new man spirit right how is he free well the answer is simple because a dead man cannot keep laws look at verse nine but ye are not in the flesh what in the world but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you're not born again, you got none of his. There's, there's nothing here for you that we're talking about. And if Christ be in you, okay, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, his righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What's the mechanism? You died when you were born again. Buried in the likeness of his death is what we show when we're baptized. Ye are dead to sin. How can you keep laws if you're a dead man? You're freed from that. And so this is what God is saying here is that you died right before you were born again. It's almost a simultaneous exchange. Dead 
the old man is, right? But quickened the new man is, alive, resurrected, right? It's hard for us to spiritually understand. We just need to, or physically understand this. We just need to look to the Bible and just accept a truth like that by faith. You are at liberty now from bondage, oppression, and the debt that you owe to the law because dead men can't keep laws. Once you're dead, you're freed from that. Christ made you alive. You're born again, a new man, alive and quickened. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. I thought you said you were free from that, brother Josh. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Okay. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have received the, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And there was the exchange that was made. You live no longer in this flesh by following after the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the body so that the Spirit can make you alive more and more and more and more abundantly. As many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. That's the manifestation of a child of God is that they are led of the Spirit. That's one of the many that you will see. The new man is in them seeking after doing good, wanting to do good. Yet too often our flesh is always containing that, putting a lid on the Spirit, doing good works, doing what the Spirit wants to do through us. Ye have not received that spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father. So ye were dead, now you're quickened. And at some time, at the same moment, perhaps, you were adopted with that new spirit, and you become a son of God. Not in bondage now to fear, but there is an adoption to the Father. And that becomes your position, your place as a newborn believer. Liberty is not, and this is, this is something that we always think it is, okay? This is something that many of the churches around here, many believers, many people that say or profess that they're believers, liberty is not just this hippie, go anywhere, do whatever you want type of freedom. Get free, dude, you know? Why are you coming at me with the law, okay? Liberty is not being at um, a point where you get more leniency with your sins. In fact, when God gives you the liberty that is in Christ, I think he actually comes down on you a little bit harder because now you got the spirit and power of him in you and he's enlightening the scriptures as you read them and you should know better, believer, right? You should know better. It's not freedom like a hippie. It's not leniency to just do whatever you want without consequence. It's not just I can just walk as I will and do it as I will. I'm free, bro. It's none of that, okay? Liberty gives us freedom to walk in love with God rather than walking after a carnal law within fear, okay? So we can walk with love in Christ, with God working with us, and that reciprocating help as I do what I'm expected, and he blesses and encourages me, and I fall and I seek him for, for help, and he picks me up. I'm in love with God walking in that love. That is the liberty that you have. That's empowerment from the Spirit, rather than what you had before. If you were seeking after God at all in the Old Testament, when the commandments were in front of you, it's not so much the same now. Not a lot of people think about the commandments every day. But I would think that the Israelites, when they saw God in the mount and the fire came down and the commandments came and they saw the rage of Moses when he saw them doing the, I would think that that nation as a whole would have a general fear of God. Anyone who saw that, they would just, yeah, there was the rebellious ones. Yeah, there was the sons of Belial that didn't even want to regard God in their knowledge. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. But by and large, I think that there was a carnal law, which was the law of the land, and men were in bondage to it. They were in fear of it. They were, they were trapped by it because every day they would think about these things as they performed the sacrifices or as they did the carnal ordinances or as the rituals took place or as they gave their tithes or whatsoever was part of that religious thing. When they had God on the mountain, they were so fearful, they said, they said, Moses, plead with God that he doesn't even talk to us anymore. Just, we'll deal with you, okay? Your glowing face is terrible enough. Don't let us talk to God. Don't have us see God. Don't have God thunder from the mountaintops and shake this whole place and terrify us anymore. We would rather just speak to you. 
Why? Because they were under a carnal law that just brought fear. But Christians, our liberty comes from the fact that we can walk in love with God rather than always being trapped by the fear of doing a list of cardinal ordinances. That's a wonderful gift, and that is Christian liberty. And how does this play out? It's because he hath made us perfect. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. You ever feel like something's missing? If you're a believer, you're complete. Don't forget that. Ye are complete in Christ. You're complete in Christ. Your flesh still has holes in it, and I can see them, right? Your neighbor can see them. Your spouse can see them. Your children can see the holes in your flesh. But you are complete in Christ, okay? You are, you are completely whole in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. That's a good person to be in completeness with, eh? I just said, eh? <laughs> ah, I said I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> Verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncertainty circumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses all trespasses all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over it. Amen. God has given us through that death experience, through that resurrection experience, through the operation of God when we only gave him our faith, he has taken a dead rotten flesh and put it to death where it deserves, put it in the ground, and then quickened us together with him, forgiving you all your trespasses, blotting out even the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us. And that is the, the action that breaks the condemnation of the law there. Christ stepped in, made us dead men that were quickened simultaneously, now alive in him. Therefore, the ordinances by the covering of his blood are blotted out. That handwriting against us that was contrary to us is taken out of the way and forever and for all eternity to those that would believe it. It's nailed to that cross. It's there. It's done with. It's over. It is finished if you believed in him and trusted in him. We are complete in him. So don't get trapped. And this is what the Colossian church was, was doing. Don't get trapped in, into your mind convincing yourself that you're not. This is what he's saying when he says, hey, as you have received him, walk in him. Beware lest any man spoil you for, through philosophy and vain deceit after tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ because the draw there is to in your own fleshly carnal mind, which we already established, is a problem. Problem is an error is is something that is taking your flesh on a ride and 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 drawing you away from the spirit. Beware lest you're spoiled by that. You're complete in Christ, and that's something that Christians need to always remember. Because too often we feel like again we are we are just defeated. We are just pressed down. We are just without uh, just a hope in this world. Like we were talking about this morning, we think that we can't even pray to God because we've got this many sins in our life, and we feel like we got to repent of all of our sins to have prayer access to have him even hear us that is one of the philosophies and the traditions and the rudiments of this world and that is handicapping you as a believer that is making you in bondage and we don't want to be in that bondage anymore you have liberty christians you're free from all that christians okay so trust in that by faith 
Verse 20, the Bible says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? If the truth is black and white in front of you that ye are dead, your life is hid with Christ and God, and you are free from these things, why are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments of and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. When you as a believer get yourself back under the ordinances, back under the rudiments, you let yourself go back into bondage, you are, yeah, maybe showing some wisdom and your your will worship and humility, but it is all, as the Bible says in verse 23, to the satisfying of the flesh. You're just doing that fleshly exercise like we talked about this morning. You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite, right? You are not living in the God-giving liberty that he has provided for you and therefore you're just doing fleshly carnal exercises you're complete in him and don't get trapped into believing that you're not that you're missing something you have everything in christ does christ lack anything no and you're in him and he in you right salvation by faith yes we all believe that sanctification by faith also Believe that you are changed, that you are new, that you are born again as the Bible tells us and affirms to us constantly. Believe that, trust that, and, and, and act in that way. I've heard the saying that Christians aren't fighting for victory. Christians aren't fighting for victory. We're not struggling and striving and trying to gain the victory. Christians aren't fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. The war is over. We've won, right? The old man is dead. The new man's alive. We're simply waiting for the curtain to fall when Christ returns in the clouds and brings us together with him. The war is over. It is written. Have you read Revelation? God wins. The devil loses. Believers join him and everyone else burns, okay? That's settled. That's established. And if you're a believer on Christ, you're not fighting for victory. You're not trying to get an edge on the devil, on your sin, on, on your flesh. You've won. It's over. The victory's already been achieved. And so when you believe that by faith, it's just like everything. Kind of a, a, a trigger goes on. There's an action in believers when they start acting in their faith that allows for God to really start moving in your life and allows God to really start doing some great things. Your flesh is dead, and the Bible records that you need to reckon it so. Reckon it. Mark it. Put it down. It's it's finished. Just as Christ nailed those ordinances to the cross for us, so your flesh is dead. Therefore, you don't have to be in bondage unto its will anymore. You are now subject to one will, and that's of God the Father. See, these religious checklists that we come up with, those are a trap, okay? We always... We always think about these things, and some of them are okay. You know, you got to pray, you got to read your Bible, you got to soul win, you got. We've got these religious checklists, but we have seen it time and time again. We were talking about people that get reprobated, right, in the in this movement, in this group. But some of them, legitimately so, because they've proven themselves to be not believers, to be wolves amongst lambs, to be to be to be wicked people. These, though, and how many of them do we know? You can, just, you can just think about it, right? How many were three to thrive, reading their Bibles, praying, going soul winning, doing everything that the checklist would approve? They were doing these things to the satisfying of the flesh. Their own flesh, your flesh, they were just glorying in the flesh. And no matter how much cologne and nice suits you put on it, flesh still stinks, okay? Flesh is rotten. It's good for nothing. But you have a quickened spirit, and that's where you need to walk. Verse 16 of chapter 2, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The, the essence of it all, the, the manifestation of all of these things is Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, the worshiping of angels, 
shells, intruding in those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourished, ministered, and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. And it continues and says, why are you subject unto these ordinances? And the ordinances were just like this. Hey, you have to keep this feast. You have to keep this drink. You have to take this holy day. You have to observe this new moon. They were ordinances that were imposed on the people that were never supposed to be used in that fashion. But these were using them to the end that their vain, fleshly, puffed up mind could just stay and grow vain, fleshly, and more and more puffed up and puffed up and puffed up. But be it not so, believers, ye are free from these things. So this freedom is not because we just talked about ordinances and laws and commands and and those types of things and how you don't, you're you're not, you're not to be judged or allow people to judge you therefore in those things. You know, judge not. This is not what we're talking about. Judge not, judge not, judge not. I'm just going to live my life however I please. This is not this uh, I find God out in the forest kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I find God when I'm in my room with a candle lit or, or all these things where people will tell you at the door that, oh, I, I, I can find God anytime. I don't need to come to church, blah, blah, yada, yada, right? But it's clear that there is a liberty of, in Christ, okay? But this liberty isn't that. It's not this just free from any kind of commitment or any kind of works of God. Galatians there, if you go back a few pages, is a book that is dealing with very heavily being free from bondage. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, there's a warning in verse 4. It says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he's talking here about the fact that there were false brethren. There were liars and deceivers who came in privily to spy out the liberty and their end would be to destroy that liberty. And ultimately, the truth of the gospel is what's at stake here. He says in Galatians chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, so after the warning comes about these that have crept in, he gets to the point by dealing directly with the Galatians that have been uh, brought into this bondage, that have been carried away with the same dissimulation. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So what happened to these believers? They fell back under the cardinal ordinances. They fell back under the oppression, the subjection. The opposite of liberty was what these were experiencing because they were bewitched, because they were fooled, because they were tricked into getting that way and allowing themselves to become that that way. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, stand fast. And this is the admonishment to the believer. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And this wasn't just the act of circumcision. This was you coming back under the circumcision, under the law, under the ordinances, under that bondage again. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And this is what happens when we get into the trap. This is what happens when we get brought back under that law. It's because we have been persuaded. It's because we have been brought back by troubling into the bondage that is set before us. And that we get caught into him. This persuasion, verse 8, cometh not of him that calleth you, the Lord. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in 
in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, not unto bondage, not unto fear, not unto being under the laws and the circumcision and the cardinal ordinances. Ye brethren have been called unto liberty. And look at this. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You've been given liberty, but again, it's not so you can just go and sing Kumbaya, grow your hair long, be a hippie in the woods. It's not so you can just drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and say, I'm free, man, in Christ. Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death, and so therefore, none of this stuff applies to me anymore. He's saying, ye have been given liberty, only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. You are free now, believer, to follow the Spirit and keep those two commands. And look what he says at the beginning of that. He says, by love, serve one another. The second commandment after love thy neighbor as thyself is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those are the two commandments on which all of them hang. And this is why those don't, and I'm not going to say they don't apply to us, but what I'm going to say is we are no longer subject unto them as in the bondage that would condemn us. Christ nailed them to his cross, said it is finished, and now we have love thy neighbor and love the Lord God. And we do those things by following after the spirit that he gave us as our minister, protector, guide, our, our, our savior in situations, as the Lord of all descending and living bodily within us. You see how we're, we're, we're at a higher plane now? We have every opportunity to do what God says because God gives us everything at our disposal to use in order to do so. We can keep the law because he's empowered us to do so. If we walk in the spirit, the law is kept. If we walk in the flesh, that's when we fall short. We are at liberty to choose, right? Before we didn't have liberty, we were always condemned. Now we have liberty to walk in the spirit. And if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Another verse that explains it is Psalm. And you don't have to go there. You can turn to James chapter one. Psalm 119 and verse 14 says, and I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. You see how liberty isn't just completely separate from the precepts, the laws, the commands, the ordinances of God. Rather, you walk at liberty because you're seeking after the precepts. That's Old Testament. But now, every time you get these precepts in you by reading in them, God takes those and calls those things to remembrance so that you're given all the more power by his spirit to keep them, to do them, to be armed when your flesh rises rises up and tries to, you know, bubbles and festers and starts to do its thing. Or when Satan comes and tempts you, same thing. You got these words of God at your disposal where you can use them in order to get free from a scenario and from a situation. So I told you to go to the James chapter one. I just wanted to give a little bit of example about, about being free from sin um, and, and being, being at liberty but not using liberty as an occasion to the flesh. So I drove in uh, on Friday afternoon, and uh, I, I don't know why you guys don't pay enough taxes, but I think you should so that I don't have to. So I'm driving down this highway, and it's like every five minutes, they're asking me for another buck 50, another buck 50, <laughs> another buck 50. And then they stop for a little bit, and I'm like, okay, this is good. And then the next one comes up. I'm like, what in the world? And it's like 360. I'm like, I just, it just doubled. And I'm thinking of turning back now because by the time I get to Rock Falls, it's going to be like 20 bucks just to like get over that last intersection. You know, obviously, you guys don't pay enough taxes out here because I had to do it, okay? <laughs> but here's the deal about that. Now, we are to love our neighbors and we're to love God, correct? So 
Brother Shane from Canada, he lent my wife and I the van. He, he, he had the gas tank full when I got here. He enabled me. He gave me the power to get down here. And so I'm driving down here in his vehicle with his gasoline, and, and, and he enabled me to do it. Let's, and I may regret this, but let's make Brother Shane the God here. <laughs> okay, so he enabled me. He empowered me. He gave me everything I need to do what I needed to do. Now, God says love one another, love your neighbor. So as I'm going down this highway of life, okay, there's two choices when you get to these tolls. You can go over and throw your shekels in there, or you can go straight and they will bill you later, okay? Now, Christ, our Lord, paid for all of our sins, past, present, future, amen? Right? Let's say Brother Shane paid for my gas, past, present, and then anything that subsequently would come over. Because that thing that I, I'm looking at says, oh, we'll mail you the bill. Okay? So I have liberty as a believer traveling down that highway to either do what is right and get off and pay the money, or I can go straight and let God deal with it later. Do you see how if I was to just drive straight and then go back, hand him his keys, in a few weeks, he's probably going to get a bill in the mail and he's going to have to pay that bill. He's going to be cross with me, okay? God, Jesus, paid all of our bills, all of our debt, right? It's all paid, it's all bought, it's all covered for. And if I just drive straight, he's going to have to cover that, but he's not going to be pleased. Also, who else isn't pleased? The guy over here that is expecting my $1.50. The guy that is expecting. So I am sinning when I choose to do wrong against my brethren over here in the toll booth and against God that enabled me and empowered me to do what is right by going to the toll booth and, and, and paying what I'm supposed to and doing what I'm supposed to. But you see how as I'm driving along, I could just easily, because I have liberty, I could easily do wrong. I would never pay for that debt Someone else would and already did. I would never have to worry about that because it's already covered for. But I would have a God that was cross with me. I would have a brother back there in Canada who would go, whoa, what's this bill, right? That's the picture of God the Father. Your sins are paid for, but why would you just make him cross? Why would you make him angry? Why would you sin against him and against the people that you should be doing right to? No, you have liberty. Only use it not as an occasion to the flesh. Use it to choose to do right. And when you choose to do right, your brethren are blessed and they got what they needed from you. And your father is blessed because because you chose right. He's happy. The brethren are happy. You have done what you ought to do. Empowered by the spirit that leads you. James chapter 1. Where are we? James chapter 1 and verse 21. James chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So lay apart filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness. Lay aside those carnal things. Rather, receive with meekness that engrafted word which is able to save your souls. What do we say about the Spirit? He empowers us bringing things into remembrance as we read them. So if we receive that engrafted word, he'll bring it to remembrance and it'll give us more and more power to continue to do what the Spirit of God intends for us and desires for us to do. Lay apart the filthiness, receive the word which is able to save your souls. That word which is able to keep you in the Lord's good books, keep you in his favor when you are doing right by him. Verse 22 says, but, and here's the catch, here's the rub. Sometimes we, we receive that engrafted word, which is able to save our souls, but we don't let it do that, do we? But be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So how often do we receive that word? We get a lot of head knowledge, but then we don't do what we're supposed to do. I'm driving down the highway. I'm reading the signs, right? I'm receiving the word that says, go over here and give your cash or go here and someone else will pay it later. Okay. I'm receiving in the word that is able to save our souls. But if I'm not a doer of the word and I don't make the right decision, then I am deceiving myself into thinking that I have liberty to do so. Verse 23 says, for if you be a hearer of the word and not a doer, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass for behold, 
He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man that he was. So if you receive the word but don't do what it says, it's like when you look in the mirror and you still got toothpaste all over your face and you say, all right, and then just walk away and go about your business. You are not a doer of the work. You've beheld your faith. You straightway go away and you forget what manner of man you are. You forget what you even saw until other people see it on you. And other people are affected by the grossness all over your face that you should have just wiped away, right? Verse 25 says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So if you are doing what the law of liberty gives you power to do, then you are one that is blessed in your deed. This is what the Bible is, is bottom line in the teaching of liberty, I believe, saying that you are free in Christ because the old man is dead. Now, your job is to receive with meekness the engrafted word. You've believed on Jesus Christ. He's given, a, your, given you of his spirit, which emboldens you, empowers you, calls these things to remembrance as you receive them. And when that happens, now you're able to save your soul. Now, when you read the word of God, the Holy Spirit will say, yep, that's you, get it right. Yep, that's you, get it right. And you can be a doer of the work that he gives to you. Now, when you go to the Old Testament scriptures, you read them, you learn from them, you understand them, and you apply them. Now you are a doer of the work that God sets before you. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to make sure that when you read Leviticus, you're not going to forget what you read in Isaiah. You're not going to forget what you read in James. You're not going to forget what you read in Jeremiah. And all over the Bible, you'll have a big picture of God the Spirit bringing remembrance to you so that you've just got all power. It's not this the most powerful item in the entire universe this has everything that we need for all matters of faith and practice this is the guide of things that you must do before you leave earth right that's what they say that acronym this is all power given unto me in heaven and in earth christ transmitted it through sinful men in order that we could take it and behold it and read it and then on top of that just the icing on the cake he sends his spirit would just simply will, hey, remember this verse. Hey, remember this verse. Hey, remember this verse. Hey, remember this verse. And so the entirety of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that any particular man in the entire universe could ever need is, amen, at our disposal. We have it at our fingertips. Not only that, though, it's in our hearts. And when you are one that is not a forgetful hearer, it is because you are a doer of the work. And those that are doing the work, it's because they have been given liberty to do so. You're no longer under bondage. You are no longer under the fear of God's wrath. He set you free from that. Now, our only requirement is to get this word in you and let this word do its work. He promises it would be so. Seek and do the law because that is what best is best and that is how a man becomes blessed in his deed. It's a simple promise from the scriptures. You're at liberty, believer, to choose right. Don't waver to the left or to the right. Go straight and narrow where God wants us and he outlines it very clearly in his scriptures. And so we're not free to just do whatever we please. No, but we are free to let God take hypothetically, that steering wheel to guide us, to show us where to go, to show us the step. Walk in the light as he is in light. Walk in the direction that he has for us. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right, but simply let the spirit guide you. And when you are spirit led, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And you see how that is complete liberty. Your flesh is just, yeah, when you're completely dedicated to allowing the spirit of God to lead you. And that is the liberty that Christians have been given Glory to God. Walk in that light. Walk in the liberty that you have in Christ Jesus, wherein he hath made us free. This liberty of yours, believers, is that. It's yours. Take it. Take possession of that by faith. That liberty is mine. I'm free. This law can't hold me down, but this law can, through the Spirit, give me power so that I can do whatever God has for me. Just believe it. Trust it. Amen.
Thank you, God, for this day, Lord, and for your word. Uh, spoken in, in due time, right in the nick of time, just when I needed it most. I thank you, Father, for this, this opportunity. I thank you for these beloved saints here that are gathered. I pray, God, you would continue to bless this church, bless that little church in Toronto as well, and help us all to realize that we are free from the bondage of sin, and you've made us so. We have liberty in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.